trigger warning, suicide, substance abuse, and substance addiction, grief, and death is discussed in this podcast episode 194. Some people may find this triggering. If this causes you any distress, please contact Lifeline Australia on 13 11 14 or in a crisis please contact your nearest hospital emergency services or a qualified medical doctor or medical professional hi everyone it's eve atley blowitz from spiritgirl.com and welcome to feel good from within i'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guests litzia williams and eleanor haley both mental health professionals who are the founders of What's Your Grief. We're going to be here today talking to them about their brand new book, What's Your Grief, which includes 75 lists to help you through any losses. Mm -hmm. They also have created a website and a community for people who are grieving. Welcome. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much for having us. Wonderful. We're really excited to be here. Super grateful you are all tuning in with us today. And I want to welcome our global community and audience. So before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell us a little bit about yourself? Eleanor Haley, my background is in mental health, which is how I met Lisa. And we put our heads together to start What's Your Grief years and years and years ago. I was really interested in psychology and I just took a path. I started there and I said, where can I go with this and how can I follow it? And I followed it through a master's program. I really wanted to work with people. I wasn't exactly sure how. And coming out of my master's program, I got a job working at an organization providing a grief support to people at the time of a loved one's death, usually a sudden or unexpected death. And interestingly, or coincidentally, or but around the same time, my mother had been terminally ill with pancreatic cancer, which is a type of cancer that is often caught pretty late from diagnosis, unfortunately, to when she died, there wasn't a lot of, of time. So I was at the time kind of still processing what was going on with my mom. And then two weeks after I started at this job supporting grieving people, my mother died. So all of a sudden I went from just like, I'm not really sure what area I want to work in in psychology. I want to do counseling. I want to work with people to really in my life and in my professional work being thrust into the world of grief and bereavement. I worked there for a while and that is where I met Lisa and we're supporting people at the time of a loved one's death at hospitals all throughout our area. And we were meeting them at a time that is possible to really be able to help anybody because what they One, it's not something you can really give them, but we were trying to be there to provide whatever support we can. And then we often stayed in touch with these families for about two years afterwards through an aftercare program. We were trying to support people, not just from all different areas with all different types of losses, but also at all different points in their grief. We met working and one of the things that was frustrating to us when we kind of put our heads together trying to solve some of the problems that we had in this workplace was that we were not finding the types of resources that we wanted to offer to people. I'll share on Lisa's behalf. I usually do. She doesn't mind me saying so. She also had experienced the death of a parent in early adulthood. And so we were often looking at the resources available through the lens of our mental health background. Lisa's background is in social work and in the lens of having lost a loved one. Just long story short, what we were finding was that there weren't the types of resources that we wanted. This was about 10 years ago. Grief resources have really come a long way in that time. But at the time, it was pretty sparse, especially on the internet. But we just said, you know what, let's just start writing the types of stuff that we would want. What we were hoping for was stuff that was a little more thorough, a little more informative, also written in a more of sort of a relatable way, talking about grief in the way that we like to talk about it. I mean, just kind of an everyday type of conversational tone rather than some of the more cerebral or very serious type of content. I know grief is an extremely serious topic, but some of the conversations that we were having were incredibly deep, but at the same time, light in a way, grief becomes a part of your everyday. So you have to kind of make it human. Wanted to write in that way. And that's what we did. 10 years later, 600 articles on the website later, a book and a couple of other initiatives. We're still here. I'm so sorry about the loss of your mother. How old were you when you lost your mother? I think I was 20 at the time. I had some time with my mom, younger siblings who 
were much younger than I was, but I didn't have nearly enough time with her. I had just gotten married and I was pregnant with my first child and I was just about to start life and had my first real job and we lost her. And unfortunately, I've had this whole adult life without her. Even though I was an adult, I still felt very much like a a very young person who needed her mother. I don't feel so young anymore, but I feel like I need my mother still. That was life-changing experience, to say the least. So sorry to hear, but thank you for sharing your story. Lisa, I'm sorry to yeah. hear that you also lost Plus my dad when I was 18. And I also had a younger sibling. So my I had a sister who was 12. And like Eleanor, it had a real impact on my life. I think for most people who've lost someone, of course, it devastates your world. But it certainly, in both of our cases, also shaped where we ended up professionally. My dad died when I was at my first year at university and it was kind of both an expected and unexpected death. Like we knew he was sick. We thought he was going to get better. Like it didn't seem like it was necessarily going to be something that would be terminal. And then he died really quickly from an infection. It was something for me where I think my path, I took a little bit of a winding road before I got to mental health. I used, I think in a lot of ways, my studies to cope with my grief. I studied philosophy and religious studies because I think in a lot of ways, though I started thinking I would be a math major after my dad died, I was kind of just looking for answers. Grief really makes you ask big existential questions about why we're here and why do these things happen and what's our purpose. I really spent a lot of time with that. And then later I realized, wow, I don't really want to just kind of be thinking about things. I really want to be hands-on working with people and trying to make an impact in that way. That was kind of the road that brought me around to social work and working with people who experienced a lot of different types of loss. So I ended up meeting Eleanor where we were working at a place where people had lost a loved one who died. Before that, I had been working in homeless services and with kids in the juvenile services program. And, you know, I really had seen that there was death-related loss, but there was also a lot of non-death loss that people were grieving, people who were experiencing homelessness or who were going through incarceration or who had loved ones with addictions and were kind of grieving those relationships. All of that kind of came together and brought me to this professional place of what's your grief. I'm sorry to hear that you lost your father at such a young age. After my dad died, though, it was a really tough period, my sister was only 12 and developed a really severe substance use problem, a really bad heroin addiction. In many ways, she would say definitely happened because she really struggled after my dad's death. Through that period, I really came to understand a lot more about addiction and how we grieve while people are still alive. And and ultimately, a big part of what's your grief, we do a lot of work around those grieving overdose related deaths because when my sister and I were in our 20s, her partner at the time died of a drug overdose. And it was really in the early days of the opiate epidemic. And there was not a lot of grief support at all for people who were grieving substance related deaths. And so I had this kind of interesting point of comparison because we had grieved my dad's death. No one's comfortable with death, but at least when somebody's sick and dies kind of in one of those ways, people are a little more comfortable. But when somebody dies of a drug overdose, there's so much shame and stigma and guilt. We really saw the differences in how we received support and people's comfort around it. That became a big part of certainly my personal loss story, but also a big part of shaping what's your grief. Because certainly I've always been really aware of this space of substance use, losing people to substances and how much of a need there is for support. It was interesting through your book, you allow people to share their grief stories. Well, what we included in our book, I think specifically in like one or two different places, are really things that we pulled out of some creative initiatives that we have done over the years around grief. It's not necessarily that people come and share their whole grief story on our site or through any of these initiatives, but rather we ask people to think about their story through a certain lens. So one of the things that we do include in the book is six word stories 
about grief mm. that people have shared with us. If people are not familiar with the idea of six word stories, it goes way back to Ernest Hemingway, the fable says, or maybe it's a true story. People are, it's contested. Ernest Hemingway supposedly wrote the first six word story. And since then, there's been a lot of different initiatives that have used the six word story. We thought that it was something that would be interesting to use when talking about grief. It's basically write a story in six words, but we asked people to write a story or, or share something about their grief in six words. And we think it's an interesting way to go about it because sometimes having to choose those six words, it really is very revealing. What you personally end up choosing and what someone else ends up choosing. Lita and I, brevity is not our strong suit. We'll write articles that are 2,000 words long. So having to really focus on those six words has been something that has been a really interesting exercise for us. And just reading the six word stories of other people has been actually just incredibly moving. Even started a site called Grief in Six Words. That's all people do on the site is go and submit grief six word stories and read the stories of other people. It's really through some of those creative initiatives. We talk about grief secrets. We have invited people through some initiatives to share anonymously their grief secret because there's a lot that people are sometimes holding underneath or that they're too afraid to share with other people about their story that sometimes it feels good to get out there in the world. And then it's not in the book, but on our site, we do a lot around sharing your story about grief through photography. I think rather than thinking about conventional ways of sharing stories, we've tried to use these creative initiatives to provide people opportunities to find new ways to express themselves and use these creative outlets as coping tools. You explained in the book there was numerous types of grief. Are you happy to give our listeners an overview? With types of grief, we are always careful to start by saying these aren't distinct categories from one another where you only experience one type. These are really ways of understanding certain types of grief that can overlap with one another. But I think we find it helpful because many times people know they're experiencing grief, but there's so much that they almost can't differentiate some of the unique aspects of their own grief. And so sometimes we think the types can help. I think one that resonates with people often is we talk about disenfranchised grief, which is a grief that you experience if you feel like society or your community doesn't honor your grief or doesn't give you the right or the space to be able to grieve. It can happen if people don't think your loss is really a valid loss. Maybe they diminish it and don't think it's that significant. Or if they don't think your relationship with the person was significant enough, like if maybe if your ex dies, or if you lose a coworker and you feel intense grief, but other people are sort of like, oh, well, it's just your coworker, you know, say kind of these minimizing things. And so that's one that Many people with many other types of grief can also feel their grief is disenfranchised. We talk in the book about cumulative grief, which I think has really been on people's minds because of COVID and the many families who have lost not just one person, but multiple people in very short succession. Cumulative grief can kind of be a deceptive term, I think, in some ways, because it makes it sound like it's just about the number of people who have died or, or died in quick succession. But really, sometimes it's actually referred to as bereavement overload or grief overload. And I think that sums it up a little better because what it is, is it's the overload we experience when we feel like our grief and our stressors and our losses exceeds our capacity to cope with them. And so we just kind of shut down in different ways or we avoid. And there's no magic number. For some people, they may have lost four people during COVID and yet they still feel like they're able to cope and function and they have good support and resources. And then another person may have lost two people, but because their resources were less and there's so many other stressors in their life, they feel completely overloaded by that. So I think during COVID, we've seen a real increase of that. Delayed grief is one that sometimes happens for people where it can happen for different reasons. Sometimes it happens because we were using substances and so people kind of masked their grief or avoided their grief. And then later when they end up in recovery or sobriety, all of these losses they didn't really grieve bubble back up to the surface and they're having to deal with those. Sometimes it's delayed grief because we just need to function and people will put all their emphasis on, I've got to take care of my children. I've got to figure out how to pay the bills. So their focus becomes laser focused on those survival things that 
they kind of delay the emotional piece of actually grieving in order to get by. And then it comes up later on. Another one we talk about is ambiguous loss, which is when we grieve someone who is still alive. And I think on the surface, people hear that and and think, what does that mean? If you've ever had a loved one who had Alzheimer's or dementia, they're still here, but they're not the person who you once knew. They're not the person they used to be. Or if you've gone through the experience of maybe having children call it into the foster care system or the child services system in the U.S. where your children are separated from their biological parents or vice versa, that there's this tremendous grief, even though they're still living, but they're not together. They don't know if everybody is safe or healthy. So there's many different ways that we can grieve people who are still living. I think that covers some of the big ones. I can't cover them all, but (laughs) the important ones. That was a good summary, I think. And you talked about the secondary losses and how it affects people in different ways, how our grief is very unique to us. I think it's important to note that the five stages of grief, it's just one grief theory in many grief theories that are out there since Freud back in the early 1900s started talking about grief. And for whatever reason, five stages, it got a foothold on people. And I think because it makes such an overwhelming experience seem very understandable and navigable and something like you can just get through these stages and overcome it. And what we know from experiencing our own grief and working with a lot of people is that really is not how grief works. Though the theory might resonate with some people, there are many people that will say, I did not experience those five stages of grief at all. And so we really believe that grief is incredibly unique to the person who's experiencing it. One of the things you mentioned with secondary loss is the fact that we do experience a primary loss, for example, if it's the death of a loved one, but then there are all the many other dominoes that fall as a result of that. All the changes we go through and all the ways that we have to sort of build a different life afterwards. And that is incredibly unique to who we are, to our strengths, to our resources, to our worldview and how we see the world in the wake of loss. Our relationship with the person who died is incredibly unique. Though we might like to use theories and categories to try and understand things a little better, when it comes down to the individual, we think it's important to take a step back and just say like, this is a very human experience that is just going to be incredibly unique. And there's no predictable path or timeline that's going to tell you what's going to happen or how it's going to work in your life. What are some of the common myths and misconceptions about grief? I think probably the most common one comes right out of the five stages. And I think the most common one from people that we hear is sort of this idea that we are going to reach acceptance and we're going to move on and find closure and that they'll kind of be this neat, tidy end point to grief. And, you know, what we know is that when we lose someone who we love, that loss is always going to be with us. And with time, our grief is going to evolve. It's going to change. The pain, that acute pain of early grief, thankfully, is not going to be with us forever. But we're always going to be having that normal, natural human response to loss. And what that means is even years later, we will encounter days that are really hard. We'll face their birthday or will face a song that was their favorite song or something brings it all back up again and it can feel like it was just yesterday. We know that people often want to think, oh, after a year, grief goes away. I'll just reach that acceptance. We really want to normalize for people that grief continues, it evolves. And really in many ways, especially when it's when someone has died, grief is figuring out how we have a continued relationship with the person who died and have that connection and that continued bond with them. That ultimately grief isn't just the pain. It's also all of the ways that we keep their memory alive. It's all of the great stories that we think about with them, the values that they taught us, all of that is part of our grief. And those are things that we don't want to go away. So I think that's definitely one of the big ones, myths. I think the other one is that sort of misconception that we only grieve death related losses. I think that lots of times people think if we use the word grief, that it 
is just about death. But we know that from a sort of a mental health and human perspective of our response, that we can grieve anything that was really important to us. And there's so many things in life that we grieve, even the idea of things we imagine. For many people who struggle with infertility and who always imagined that they would have children and then learn that they'll never be able to have their own biological children. That hope for that future is something that we can lose as well. So there's just a huge range of things. And I think sometimes the misconception about grief is that we're just talking about death. Those are a couple of the ones that I think are most common. And what piece of advice would you give to someone who is new to grief, who has lost someone or something so significant that it's really impacting the way they feel, their mental health, especially if they're feeling in this complete darkness and like the dark times isn't going to ever lift and they're never going to feel better again. I think not just a cliche, the advice to take things one day at a time is extremely helpful when it comes to grief. And sometimes it's not even one day at a time, but it's one minute at a time, one hour at a time. We talk about coping. We often talk about thinking about one step at a time. What's one thing you can do to cope in this moment? I think a lot of times people are just in such pain and it's such a big experience that they're like, what's the fix? I need to get the fix to get me out of this. And the fact of the matter is it's, there is no quick fix. It's just a matter of finding ways to survive. And then after a while, like Lisa said, hopefully that intense and acute pain will subside a little bit and it becomes not just about surviving, but also about finding ways to move forward. Lisa mentioned and having a connection with loved ones who died or the past, trying to understand the world a little bit differently in the wake of loss, having connections with people, finding new purpose and meaning. That can take a really long time to get to. So just understanding that this is not in any stretch, a sprint. It's really a marathon. And I know that that's really discouraging for people who are new to grief. But like you said, it does get better eventually. And it is okay in this moment to be everything that you are. There is no right or wrong. Emotions aren't good or bad. Whatever you're feeling is normal and okay. And take it one day at a time. What would your advice be, Lisa? I think that one of the things that you said, Yvette, was that a feeling of it's never going to lift or it's never going to change. One of the things that we really encourage people, and I would tell anyone early on to consider, is that looking for even the smallest Mm -hmm. things and being just open to those, open to the smallest moments of gratitude. We were just talking about this humor. If you're somebody who is able to find one thing to make you laugh, find one YouTube video that will crack you up, find one person that you might be able to reach out to today and be able to remind yourself that like, okay, 99.9% of this day might be awful, but let me see if I can just make a point to find one thing that I can kind of get out of that. And that can sometimes slowly, that little like kernel can be Mm -hmm. something that we can start to build on because it reminds us that we're capable of laughing or capable of just even saying like, wow, this was a great cup of coffee. (laughs) Like everything else is awful, but at least I had this great cup of coffee. So I think we try to look for those little things with folks so that they can hopefully figure out how to start to build from there. In your book, you had so many lists. What made you decide to put together lists for your (laughs) book? And what is the meaning behind your book? And what really inspired you to write the book? interesting we have written a lot most of our articles are pretty long and we have about 600 of them online and we had never really wanted to write a book but then we were in the midst of covid and we were approached by a publisher who we felt kind of got us and had a similar vision and we said i think now might be the time I think we've always wanted to fill gaps in the world of grief support, and we didn't see books about grief as being a gap, except for in 2020, we saw that there was so much loss, including a lot of that non-death loss that Lisa was mentioning. And we had always been sort of aware of that, but we were finally seeing that other people were starting to notice that there are so many different experiences that are called loss that can cause a person to experience grief. What we really wanted to do was say, okay, well, now's a time where we can write a book 
that somebody who's experienced the death of a loved one hopefully would find very helpful, but also for other people, no matter the type of loss that they brought to it, would find helpful. And so that was one thing that we didn't think really existed in a really good way. And it was a space we were trying to fill with the book. And I think the list format in years of writing online, though we do write long articles, one of the pieces of feedback that we received from a lot of people over the years was, you know, I received gifts of different grief books, but they were too dense. They were too much. It felt too overwhelming to try to even tackle a book. And when I found your website, it was such a relief because I could get information in these kind of shorter articles. I could find the stuff that was relevant to me and I could kind of skip around and use the search bar. And that was really helpful. And we felt like lists offered this opportunity to try to capture some of that feeling in a book of something that didn't feel too overwhelming, that didn't feel too dense, that allowed people to also read the book cover to cover or listen to the book all the way through if they wanted to, but also to bounce around to the parts that felt the most pertinent to them. Skip around a little bit. And even if you're feeling overwhelmed or like you're can't concentrate or you're distracted, you know, all those things that come with grief that we we hope that this format might ease that a little bit. I love the list because it was short and practical and helpful. And there are so many lists, 75 in total mm-hmm. lists relating to different things. But one of the lists I really loved was the list for what someone could do in terms of self-care if they're going through grief. One of the things that we really like to focus on is well-being, which I think aligns a lot with the ideas that we have around self-care. Well-being is something that I've always found very accessible. I'm not always great with the self-care, but well-being is something that I feel I can do in the way that we think about it. The way that we talk about it is the same way that positive psychology looks at well-being. They identify there are these five sort of categories or pillars of well-being, and they use the acronym PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. And so what we say is if there's anything you can think of that you can do that could fall under one of these categories, We want you to do more of that. The first one is positive emotion. So like Lisa said, like even if in the darkest of times, 99% of the day might have been terrible, but maybe you took like 10 minutes to roll on the floor with your dog and that gave you a moment to laugh and feel that positive emotion. Like do that. That's not wasting time. That's not goofing off. That's actually hopefully increasing your well-being engagement, those things that we can do that help us to really feel what they call flow, those things that make time just fly by where we're feeling perfectly challenged. It might be things like playing music or doing even like a crossword puzzle or things like that. Relationships. So obviously anything that helps to make us feel connected, meaning the things that really align with our values and our meaning in life. And then accomplishment. And so when we talk about accomplishment, we're not talking necessarily about those big accomplishments, though those are great. We're talking about the smallest of things in grief. So like I had three things on my to-do list today. I checked off two. I'm going to give myself credit and congratulate myself for those two things I accomplished. What we try to tell people is do anything that falls under these pillars and they can be the smallest of things. Like the list of 50 things you might make that fall under those pillars might be things that could take two minutes each, or it might be a thing that's like an hour of watching this show you love on Netflix and you are tempted to feel like you're wasting time, but we say don't because that helps to boost your well-being. Like I said, I'm not great with the self-care and it's something that I feel like has been accessible for me. Like sometimes I'll be laying, my daughter will climb into bed with me in the morning. I'll be like, I really should get up. I should do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, I'm going to take this extra 10 minutes to lay in bed with my three-year-old because this is what really boosts a lot of those things for me. It comes from sort of a place of, oh, this is what personally resonates with us. But there is a lot of research and backing behind it as well. And we just find it to be so accessible. That's for me. I don't know if you would add anything, Lisa, from a self-care perspective. The only thing that I would add is that sometimes remembering that those things that we do to take care of ourselves, that it can feel like it's just general self-care, but 
they can actually be indirectly helping us to cope with our grief. Mm Because if we're not doing the basic things to take care of ourselves, to just like get good sleep and make sure that we're actually kind of taking care of how we're eating and like the basic things that we need to do to rest and to recharge and to take a break from grief sometimes and to know that we can't spend all of our time just like pouring into those emotions, sometimes distracting ourselves, all of that kind of builds up our emotional and physical and spiritual reserves to then be able to, in some of the hardest moments, face the really, really difficult parts of grief. Sometimes people will feel like, oh, I should be tending to my grief all the time, but that's not how it works. You know, we tend to our grief and then we tend to just like the work of living in the world after loss. And we need to take care of ourselves so that we can do all of those things. Yeah. If we have a family member who has lost a loved one, would you recommend that we continue to check in regularly with them after that one month mark to see how they are? Absolutely. I think that one of the things I tell people all the time, and I do this in my personal life, is I put reminders on my calendar for days that are potentially going to be hard for friends of mine who've lost somebody. What's the anniversary of the death? What was that person's birthday? So that I can cue myself to remember that for me, it might just be the middle of June. It doesn't feel like it means anything. But for them, if it was their husband's birthday or their anniversary, that it might be 10 months later and they're facing the first anniversary without their partner, that's going to be a really tough time for them to really think about it proactively Mm -hmm. and say, what can I do to be remembering that I need to check in on an ongoing way, but also prompting myself, doing, setting some little reminders, and then being open to just listening to what people need. I've literally said these exact words to a, a friend right after a loss. I'm going to keep checking in every week until you tell me to stop checking in every week. I think that way they just know, okay, somebody's here and they're checking in and they're making sure I'm okay. And they're waiting for me to say, all right, I'm good. Maybe we can go back to like every other week, every every three weeks, start to space it out a little bit. Because oftentimes people do feel like, wow, after the first month, it's like everyone forgot about me. Everybody kept going with their life and I'm still over here trying to just dig my way out of this hole. We always encourage people to keep checking in. And you also mentioned in your book, sometimes we don't know what to say to someone who has had a loss And sometimes it's okay just to say, we're sorry for your loss. In an example, for someone who's grieving a loss through suicide, a family member or a friend, that can be a very uncomfortable conversation. We don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Is it best that we just say, we're sorry for your loss? If you need anything, let me know. I'm here for you. And it's okay to say, I don't know what to say. I think it's okay not to know what to say. And I think that sometimes we have to like base it on what our relationship is with that person. But I do think it's okay to acknowledge that you don't have the right words. What we always remind people is that there are no words that you can say that will take away the pain of that person. And you are not going to be able to help them have any sort of aha moment where they all of a sudden find meaning just because you tell them what meaning to find and so on and so forth. But we do often say that we just want to offer our support is what we want to offer. We talk a lot about shifting from thinking about the need to offer comfort because comfort is trying to take away the pain and that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to do that. So instead of thinking of yourself as a comforter, to think of yourself as a grief supporter. And so whatever it means based on your relationship to offer that support and to just say, I am here. And to really mean that too. A lot of times grieving people will feel hurt by the people who said, oh, let me know if you need anything and then really truly disappeared. We really think that it's important, like Lisa said, to sometimes say, if you want steps for grief support, here they are. Check in, offer love and support and repeat and keep doing it. And I I think that people do maintain that presence. People will believe that you genuinely mean it. We really want to emphasize that there are no right words. And if all you have to say is, I'm sorry, I'm here, I love you, that's enough. 
if you really mean it and if you really do stick around. Love those words of wisdom. Living in times where we have this positivity culture where you may have lost a job and you go, you'll be right, you'll be fine, you'll find something new, everything happens for a reason. But sometimes positivity doesn't help that person, does it? It can make them feel even more lousy. Absolutely. I mean, because it minimizes depth of the experience. It sort of takes that moment and says, I can't just be here and be present with your pain and how hard this is. Instead, I'm over here trying to find a silver lining and make it feel better. And it's well-intentioned sometimes that they want you to not be struggling. But in that moment, oftentimes what people want is not someone to pull them out of their struggling through this positivity. It's somebody who says, this is awful. This is a terrible thing. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. And I'm here and I'm going to sit with you through all the messiness. And if that's watching TV or you want me to go to the grocery store or you want to cry on my shoulder, whatever it is, I'll be there for it. But I'm not going to be the person who's telling you you need to feel differently than you're feeling or that you should just think happy thoughts and it'll all go away. Yeah. In your experience, does it take different times for different people and some people maybe bounce back sooner than others. I think that goes back to that idea that there's just no timeline for grief. There's no one standard way that people will grieve and how amount of time that X, Y, and Z will take. I do think it's an incredibly variable depending on the person, depending on if it's a death loss, the role that that person played in their life, depending on the support that they have, whether or not their loss is being validated by other people, whether they have resources. Oftentimes it's about the type of coping that a person will use. I think that there are so many different factors that can impact how long it takes for a person to feel like they're past that really intense, acute part of grief. Like Lisa said, for a lot of us, it's going to be forever. It's always going to kind of be there. It's like some sort of ache that lies dormant until it rains, right? And then all of a sudden it starts acting up. Grief is always sort of there in the background for a lot of people. How long it will take to get to the place where that really, really tough, tough, dark time passes. It depends on the person. One thing I would add to that is that it's important to remember that sometimes what we see on the outside doesn't necessarily reflect what someone is going through on the inside. And again, that has to do with the way that we all cope. Some people are really struggle to get back to work but they may be really doing a great job of building up their other relationships and using support groups or finding things that are working as they're taking care of themselves. Then there may be other people who get right back to work. They seem fine and they're functioning and everybody's like, look at them. They're doing great. They're okay. But really when they get home from work, they're falling apart. They're isolating from other people. They're disconnected. They're not finding ways to take care of their grief. Sometimes what we see on the surface or the way that we understand what does it look like to be okay or to not be okay, it doesn't always match up with what we see on the outside from people. So we always just tell people for themselves to be kind and patient and compassionate with themselves and know that there's no right way or right time frame. And for other people to be compassionate towards other people, but also to remember that even if you think it looks like on the outside they're doing great, that it can be really hurtful to say things like, oh, like, I'm so glad to see that you're doing so well or that you're getting over this or that you're moving on. But it's better to really ask people, how are they doing? Don't assume that just because they look great to you that they're feeling great. Sometimes people look great on the outside and what they really need is you to acknowledge that and say, looks like things are going well, but I imagine it's complicated and maybe not. How are you doing? And invite a space for honesty about how people feel. Invite a space for honesty about how people feel. And you mentioned we can be there for them. I'm here for you. We're looking at being a supporter, a grief supporter for Mm -hmm. family members or friends. And then also there's no timeline for grief and grief whilst it changes us it will always be there and come in ebbs and flows especially around birthdays or Christmas or even you mentioned if you hear a song of a loved one and 
when it comes to grief by suicide, you talked about counterfactual thinking going over and over, and I've experienced this through losing a loved one, a cousin through suicide, where it's the what ifs, I wish I could have done that, I should have done that, why didn't I do that, why didn't she come to me, and it goes over and over and over and over again. And this can play out for years. Can you share a little bit about that when we have grief, guilt, and what we can do when we're ruminating and it's going over and over? This is such an important point and question because so many people who've lost loved ones to suicide and to many other things as well will find themselves in that rumination cycle and that guilt, coulda, woulda, shoulda, going back over it. And one place we always encourage people to start with just recognizing in kind of a broad way is that sometimes part of the reason that we want to do that is that we want to seek some sort of sense of order or control. We want to imagine that things work in kind of this logical, orderly way. And if we could just go back in time and find this one thing or this one moment that we would have been able to prevent everything that happened, or we would have been able to kind of solve it and it would have gone differently. And Sometimes when we recognize that when we're doing this, what we're seeking is we're seeking some sort of order or control. We recognize that the hard thing is sitting with the reality that sometimes there isn't an order. Sometimes there are things that are outside of our control that we couldn't have known, that we couldn't have seen, and to start there. And then to really think about this idea about hindsight bias, that when we are looking back at things that happened before the loss, we are often looking at it through the lens of what we know now. And we suddenly go back and we see things and we assume that there were things that should have been obvious at the time, or that there were things that we should have known. And we look back and it's only now because we know what's happened that we look at it that way. But oftentimes at the time, we couldn't have seen that. We couldn't have known that we were doing the best that we could with what we had at the time. And to kind of give ourselves grace and really try to remember where was I at the time? What was happening then? What did I know? Versus what do I know now that I'm kind of imposing onto the past? Trying to do a little bit of that to see. And then I think the last piece with counterfactual thinking that's so important to remember remember is that the way counterfactual thinking works is that we go back and we create this story that's counter to the facts of what would have happened if we had done something differently. And often that story we create is the perfect ideal story. We imagine if I had done this differently, then he would have been okay and he would still be here and everything would be good. Create this one singular perfect story. And the reality is that we just don't know what would have happened. Even if we could go back in time and do something differently, after that moment, we still don't know how life would have unfolded because life is uncertain. It is unpredictable. Someone who's lost someone to an overdose, had family members with addiction, I think this comes up a lot. There's that feeling of if I would just gotten him to go to that rehab program, I was trying to, so hard to get him to go. And if I just had found the right words. And as people who work with so many grievers, we know hundreds of people who have gotten their loved ones into the right rehab program. And still that person has then relapsed later or died later. We don't know what would have happened. But the story we tell ourselves is the idealized story, the perfect story. So sometimes just challenging ourselves a little bit on some of those thoughts of some of that guilt of giving ourselves a little bit of grace and then learning some techniques that really can help us with rumination and to learn that sometimes it feels like we can't control our thoughts. It feels like once a thought has come into our heads, we're just going to chase that thought and keep going over and over and over. One of the really valuable things about both things like meditation and also things like tools you can learn in therapy and counseling is that we can learn to have a different relationship with our thoughts. And we can learn to kind of accept that these thoughts are coming up, but decide that we're not going to kind of chase those thoughts, that we are more than just the sum of our thoughts and we can make decisions to put our attention and our energy and try to shift our thoughts into other directions. And sometimes when the rumination is really bad, those are the things we really need to do is learn how to change that relationship with our thoughts. And you share so much about that in the book. And you also talk about self-compassion and having more self-compassion for Mm -hmm. yourself if you're grieving a loved one. 
or grieving a loss. Yeah. And I felt that was so beautiful and how that could really transform our relationship as well instead of beating ourselves up, practicing more self-compassion. You give so much. You work in the field of mental health. You are listening to stories continually about grief and loss and very heavy topics. How do you take care of your own well-being? For me, it goes back to kind of that stuff I was talking about with well-being. I also think just having some boundaries can be really helpful, especially because I work online. So we work from home. So it's very easy for things to bleed into each other. Being able to have some boundaries and say, okay, now I'm shifting to time that I'm spending with my friends or my family or doing something else is really important. I think that's important for everybody, no matter whether they're grieving or not. And for me personally, there's so much out there. People often feel like nobody's talking about grief. And then once they experience, they realize like, oh, there are all these like podcasts and there are all these movies and shows and books and things like that. And as much as I would really love to consume all that media so that I could then talk about it with people, I find that outside of work, I don't. I try to kind of keep it a little different because if I did go down that path, it would just be a ways that I would be focusing on death and grief and loss. And for me, that just feels like too much where I am in life right now. For me, it's trying to draw some loose boundaries. I'm not like necessarily the best boundary keeper, but I am working on it. Those tips are so helpful. Lisa, (laughs) what are some of your self-care rituals and how do you take care of your own self? This is something that's always been the ritual piece of self-care is what's always been tough for me. I'm one of those people who would love to say this is the thing I've gotten really good at always doing or always practicing. I have ADHD and with ADHD, it's hard to know what's the ADHD and what's just you. But for me, one thing that's hard is that I don't easily fall into routine and ritual. My days, I don't structure them that way. I tend to really go through phases where I go really deeply into one type of self-care and then I move on to another type of self-care. And I actually think that's been really amazing for me. And I usually go back to the ones that are tried and true. For me, I love hot yoga so very much. And that is in large part because, and I think maybe this is partially because of ADHD, is that it's always hard for me to find something that really gets my brain engaged enough that I can check out from other things or not be distracted by so many things. And hot yoga does this amazing sort of connection of between your mind and your body. And it's sometimes it's so hot that you're concentrating on that. You're also concentrating on your breathing and getting everything moving together. And it's just like a place for me where I feel I truly can go in and I think feel that like flow state that Eleanor was talking about that's part of PERMA and feel like time falls away. And all I have done during this time is just be in this completely present with my self. So that's one that I come back to a lot. And another one I come back to a lot that actually I missed during COVID and was really glad we opened was I really love sensory deprivation tanks or float tanks where you can just go and you just float in this perfect water, dark and black. And I just find it to be like the most relaxing place. And as somebody who loves stimulation and is always kind of has a podcast on in the background or always has music and always has different things, it's just a really nice space, I think, for my whole body and brain to just relax. Thank you for sharing that. Incredible tips. What is your hope for your newfound book readers (laughs) or newfound Audible listeners? As far as the book goes, like we just hope it finds the right people. We've always known the way that we talk about grief isn't going to be right for everybody, but we do know it's right for some people. That's true about all approaches to grief. There's not one way to talk about it or one way to cope or anything like that. So I think our biggest hope is that it finds its way into the hands of people who will really resonate with it. And then we would love for people who do read the book and think, you know, I like the way they talk about this to connect with us a little bit further on, like I said, like we started on that website and we have a lot that we talk about there. We're pretty active in social media communities at What's Your Grief is where you can find us. And then we have some other communities that we run that are a little more private. So there are a lot of different ways for people to stay connected with us. And so we just hope grief support is that type of thing where we don't want people to want to need us forever. But I do hope that the people who like what we have to say, walk with us while they need us. 
I love that. I, I hope this book finds people who need it and who appreciate it. And I hope that it also maybe gives people a way to talk about grief in a little bit more of an everyday accessible way. We always joke, you know, you don't always have to have your head tilted with like a quiet voice to talk about grief. You can just do it in some of these ways that are kind of real and human and practical. And we tried to capture that in the book because that's the way that we talk about grief and maybe that people will find a way to carry that forward into their own lives. Well, your book's incredible. Thank you so much for creating it. It's got so many practical tips, lists. There's a (laughs) lot of lists, but it's a really great way to get an overview about grief And Mm -hmm. also what other people experience, which is very unique, very different. And I think the sharing of that was incredible and especially grief in six words. That was really so different for everyone that you included. And thank you for all of the work that you do in the grief community, created an incredible online community, and you really give so much to help other people who are grieving. I mean, it's so beautiful to see. It's so incredible. And you're definitely two light workers on Mother (laughs) Earth. Love how much you're giving. Obviously, there are some people who can afford therapy. And Mm -hmm. you mentioned in the book, if you can seek a therapist who's experienced in grief, that's the way to go. But you are giving out so many free resources on your website. So yeah. for our listeners, how can they stay in touch with you? Our website's whatsyourgrief.com. So they can find us there. And then on all the major social platforms, we're at What's Your Grief. And people can always reach out and email us as well. We can't say we'll get back to you like right away, but we always try to get back to everyone. What's your grief at Gmail. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your precious time with us and helping our global community to discover what's your grief. So grateful. Thank you again. (laughs) Thank thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening in to Feel Good From Within with Yvette Lieblow at Spirit Girl Podcast. I hope you found this conversation of interest and benefit to you. In support, I would love for you to subscribe to Feel Good From Within with Yvette Lee Blowitz, Spirit Girl Podcast on any podcast app you listen to the show through or on YouTube too. And to leave a five-star rating and a review of what you think too. Be sure to share this show with your family, friends, and community and to subscribe to my mailing list at spiritgirl.com eventlyblowitz.com or feelgoodfromwithin.com. Follow Spirit Girl or Yvette Blowitz on any social media app. And together, let's feel good from within.